Well, good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. So glad that you chose to join us. So glad that you're with us. And if you would call yourself a part of Connexus, I'm sure you've really been looking forward to today's conversation. I know that Leslie and I have. We're with Carrie and Tony Newhoff. So great to be with you guys. Thanks hey. for, oh, it's great thanks to be here. for having thanks us. for making the time. And, um, and as many of you know, about five years ago, I became the lead pastor at Connexus. But Carrie what is, is, Carrie and Tony is and always will be our founders. And so we want to take some time this morning and have a conversation as Carrie's transitioning off of our staff teaching team to uh, learn from them. They've got so much knowledge, 25 years of ministry, uh, such an opportunity. They don't look Makes like it. They feel old. They don't yeah. look yeah. like it. They That's don't. a long time. I'm the only one with gray hair at the table, so let's, <laughs> let's be honest. But um, I, I want to take a few moments and just have an opportunity Leslie and I have the chance to learn from them all the time. It's such a privilege. So we wanted to give you uh, an opportunity to learn from them as well today. And Carrie, just to start, yeah. uh, to recap for people, um, why, why make the choice to move off staff at Connexus? And, and then we'll talk a little bit about what you guys are doing these days. Yeah, sure. So the short answer is I was concerned about succession when I started here. Um, I've seen it handled so poorly in church and in business. And then, you know, I'm sure we'll get into the story at some point today, but uh, we started even pre-Connexus. So Connexus is 12 years old now. But, um, you know, we started here 13 years before that in 1995 with three little tiny churches that were sort of on their their last legs. And God has done more than we ever could have asked or imagined mm -hmm. in terms of the story that he's written. And so as we got into things and hundreds and then thousands of people showed up, we were like, uh-oh, this got a lot bigger than we thought <laughs> right, it would. Right, right, right. And this, this never goes well unless you plan for it. And um, I had begun just to think about, okay, what can we do for succession? And so it was five years ago that I approached you and the elders and said, what would it be like mm -hmm if we did this. And in businesses, it's something like 95% of all businesses die with their founder. That's right. And um, even though we started Connexus Church, I didn't want that to be our story. The mission's more important than me. It's more important than us. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make sure that it was on solid legs. And along the way, uh, this wasn't part of the plan. It just sort of happened. Um, you know, I discovered this passion for leaders. And so when we look ahead to the future, that's where I'm going to be spending my time. But it's also you know, we're not leaving the church. So right. we're leaving, but we're not leaving. We're still going to be here. This is our, this is our tribe. These are our people. Um, but we're going to be very much in a supportive role in the future. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you on the platform from time to time. From time to time. Great, yeah. Be great. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, and, and I would love to just kind of hear Tony. I know, Carrie, you're investing in leaders right now. What are you doing these days? What does that look like for you? Well, these days, uh, you may know, some people may know that I've been writing a book on marriage called Before You Split. So the manuscript's done, it's in, and right now we're taking steps toward launch. So the book launches on January 12th, 2021. Wow, that's soon. <laughs> so excited about that. Also, um, the Smart Family Podcast mm -hmm. is a podcast we started this year. I, I started it with my co-host, uh, Dr. Rob Meter, who is a, a well-known pediatrician in Simcoe County. And uh, we're just having conversations to help families. Mm -hmm. Our aim is to help people love being home. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that, I'm uh, thrilled these days to be a part of the prayer team at Connexus and doing some family law mediation. Okay, great. Yeah, wow. Amazing. I love I love how you guys are continuing to serve people. Now, now, Tony, I've never asked you this question, so I'm excited to hear the answer today. I've well, never so had, I, yeah. I've heard I've heard the answer from Carrie, but I've never asked you the question. Okay. So the idea of creating a church that unchurched people love, where where did that all start from your perspective? Where do you think the seed of that kind of began? Wow. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> The seed, I think, um, goes way back to uh, the Presbyterian minister who oversaw the three churches we joined, 
uh, way back in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, his name is George Cunningham. Mm -hmm. There may be a few people who still remember who he is, but yeah, he, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we still remember George. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but he was such an enthusiastic uh, Christ follower, mm -hmm. and I know he was praying for revival mm -hmm. of those churches along with other people. And so when you look for the spark of you know, what led to all of these things that we've been so privileged to be a part of, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that was, that was a spark. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, there were leaders in those churches who just had a heart for people, who had a heart for people coming to know Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent us away on a conference, mm -hmm. um, a conference um, in North Carolina, yeah. actually, and the whole theme of the conference was how to reach people who are outside the walls of your church. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing led to another, and then we joined North Point as a strategic partner. So, mm -hmm. But all the way along, we've been surrounded by people and leaders who have just had a heart for people who are outside the church, mm -hmm. um, yeah. that they would come to know who Jesus is. Yeah. yeah, I think the hard part of that story for people to, to remember, and even for us to remember now, is like, this was the 90s, right? So yeah. the internet was dial up in my basement, like literally, <laughs> yeah. and you, you did not have access to information the way it's you true. have it is, now. Is it true that the photocopier was at your house? Like, uh, that is days? very true. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I heard the that. photocopier was in my office at my house, and we were printing out annual reports till two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah that is, that is a, a true yeah. story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So being able to go to a conference, being able to see the other churches were actually reaching on church people. And then mm -hmm. uh, meeting Reggie Joyner, Andy Stanley in the mm -hmm. mid-2000s and the invitation to start, mm -hmm. uh, you know, over again as Conexus Church with a North Point affiliation that sort of uh, launched us into the Conexus phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carrie, over the years, yeah. when, you, when you've seen, just to follow up on that, people who have a heart for unchurched people, what are the things you've seen that spark that? Like, where does that mm -hmm. come from? If somebody's mm -hmm. watching today and kind of goes like, I'm not sure I have that. Where, where have you kind of seen that grow in people's lives? I think it comes from people who are not self-centered. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the things. Like we saw that at the beginning, that we had three little churches and they were really small. Like worship could have been around this table. <laughs> right, right, right. One of them, I mean, really small. Um, and, and, but there, not everybody, but there was a majority of people who just decided that this wasn't going to be about them. Mm -hmm. And that's the best of the church. Over the 25 years, mm -hmm. that's what I've seen over and over again, is, is when you get a group of people who decide, this is bigger than me, this is more than about me. It's about Jesus, mm -hmm. but it's all about bringing Jesus to the world. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I see over and over again. And so I think it's that, that inability, because Christian maturity is not based on how much you know mm -hmm. or how much you think you know. It should be based on how much you love. Right. And love is always outward focused. Love always flows from you through you to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we're at our best at the church, it's when you have that outward focus and it's not about me and do I get what I want. And so I feel like, you know, the last 25 years, we've been casting that vision over and over again. Right. And on our good days, we get it. And there've been a lot of good days. Right, mm -hmm. right. Measured by our love, that's yeah, great. Yeah, that's great. I wonder if, you know, thinking about those early days, if you could speak to that person back, you know, 25 years ago, what would you say to your younger selves, uh, if you could? Well, um, I think the first thing I would have said is uh, find a Christian mentor, mm -hmm. someone who's a few steps ahead, mm -hmm. uh, form a relationship, and, uh, and really lean into it. Because yeah. I think what one thing I was really lacking in my earlier days, particularly because I came to faith like just shortly before oh, that. Wow. And so, yeah. um, so discipleship was a really critical thing mm -hmm. at that point. So yeah, finding a mentor. Uh, I, I think I would also tell myself to question the assumption that the way I see the world is the norm. Oh. Yeah. Uh, we recently went through that series on um, personality differences, mm -hmm. and we've um, we walked people through the uh, the road back to you. Yeah. Back to you. Yes. So helpful to yeah. know that there are really like nine different overall <laughs> approaches yes. to how to see the world. Right. 
Um, and, and also, it would have been helpful along the lines of discipleship um, to, to know about spiritual gifts and just oh. to be searching out, you know, what is the particular gift that um, the Holy Spirit has given me? Mm -hmm. So, um, and we have a resource on that yeah. now. Yeah. If, if you're interested, mm -hmm. um, check out the What's the Point? What's the Point series? What's the Point series on, on demand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. great. What about you, Carrie? What would you say to your twenty-five-year-old Carrie? Listen yes. to your wife. So I, I, I would have <laughs> been, I would have been yes. just married. Yes. Yeah. Any, any age. Listen to your yeah. wife. Uh, her, <laughs> the voice of God sounds an awful lot like the voice of Tony, yeah. and um, and she's often been right. I, I'm I'm an Enneagram eight. Not to make this about the Enneagram, but I, I tend to trust my own opinion sometimes to my peril. Oh. And uh, I would say the other thing I would say is be discerning. Um, let more people in early. Like I was sort of a, a solo act and had to learn how to fix all that. And there, there's a role for that. Like God uses right. it. But I would say, I, I would say get better, faster at um, including other people in the mission and the journey. Mm -hmm. Because my tendency was to not do that. And then sometimes I listen to the wrong people rather than the right people. Right. And that can be just as devastating. So that took me a, a little while to figure out. Yeah. Uh, I think we did land that one a little bit better. But that's what I'd say to 25-year-old Carrie. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Carrie, you're talking about listening to the wrong people versus right. listening to the right people when it comes to the mission. But I think for all of us, that's true in our own lives. Mm -hmm. How do I know I'm listening to the wrong person versus I'm listening to the right kind of people in my life? How yeah. do you discern that kind of thing for... The, for someone who's living their life, kind of, um, who's watching even today. Yeah, I would try to find, like in terms of organizationally, I would say you try to find people who have the best interest of the church in mind, our mission, mm -hmm. rather than what they think the mission should be. Because you've always got competing visions right. about what the future could be. And I found that really confusing as a young leader. So it was sort of like, well, I think I know. So I just kind of went with me, mm -hmm. which was, I had to adjust as I went along. Mm -hmm. um, I would say for your life, find somebody that you admire. Like who is somebody who's maybe a few years or a season ahead of you that you think has a life worth admiring mm -hmm. and try to get around them. And, you know, in, in, you know, with social media, Instagram, TikTok, it's easy to follow people with like a million followers and that kind of thing and say, I want time for them to mentor me. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's somebody who lives three doors down from you or around the corner or across town who will have coffee with you right. or who will connect with you and, mm -hmm. and that you really admire, who loves God, who, who lives a good life. I would try to get together with those people and, and focus on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, we found that to be true organizationally, but also for our marriage and our family, mm -hmm. right? Looking to mm -hmm. that person who's a those few years ahead of you to be able to, to learn, you know, from them. I think that's yeah. so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about, again, over the years, I wonder, do you have any regrets? Anything you would say that, that's happened that you How know, much you time wish? do we have? Yeah. <laughs> just one thing. Yeah. Just one. Yeah, people say, I have no regrets. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. I have a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, definitely I have some regrets. Yeah. Uh, one was... Uh, probably because the growth came so quickly, mm. especially in the early days, I didn't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up working too many hours and uh, I paid a price for it personally. We paid mm -hmm. a price as a family. And I've talked about it with my boys who are in their 20s and they're like, ah, dad, you were around. I'm like, no, I could have been around more. Like I know how mentally vacant I was. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I got really confused about, you know, because when I was in law, and it was a brief time, but it was pretty clear. Like, I was, I was a lawyer, but I wasn't a lawyer, you know? Right. I went to work at a firm, mm -hmm. and I came home, and I went to church on the weekend, and I had my life. Mm -hmm. But I think when what you believe is what you do, and that's also your community, yeah. that gets really confusing, and that just about took me out mm -hmm. uh, after a decade of leadership. So we had to disentangle a lot of that. The other thing I would say for regrets, and again, I got, I got a bunch, so <laughs> uh, I, I would say I was over-focused on task and not enough focused on people. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And I think I hurt some people unnecessarily mm -hmm. uh, through that. So I tend to be a, a task person, like give me a goal, I'll hit it. Yes. And um, people are not the means to the end. They are relationship is the end. So mm -hmm. that took me a little while to figure out. But yeah, there are definitely some moments I so wish weird. I could get back. Wow. I, I, you used the term, Carrie, uh, mentally vacant, mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. is a really interesting term. I think for anybody who's kind of um, working in one place and then arriving home or working in the basement and then coming yeah. upstairs <laughs> yeah. these days. Yeah. This would be my case. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. There, yeah. Um, 
I think we all know about that, hey, relationships should be a priority, but I struggle to be mentally present. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes our greatest lessons come out of our greatest regrets. What would you say to people who are saying, mm -hmm. hey, I'm like that. I got, yeah. I, I, I've got young kids at home. I'm mentally kind of not present. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, there's a series, Jeff. We right. could, we could, we could spend four weeks on this. This is great. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot under that. I would say looking back on it, I had fused my work with my identity, the ministry with my identity, and you know, you, you tend to get validated at work in a way that perhaps you don't always get validated at home. Is that fair? So it was easier you command respect at, at work in, in a way you don't res command respect at home. So there's that. And then there's, um, yeah, just the, particularly in these moments, you know, as a culture where more and more people are home-based, yeah. uh, I've been home-based a lot. We have, we have gone through numerous facilities over 25 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. Half the time that meant I had to work from home because there, so I've been doing remote work for 25 years right. off and on. And it's having clear boundaries and finding like when, when we were not in a good place in our marriage, um, I would say I used work as an escape. It was, yeah. you know, certainly drugs were not an option and mm -hmm. alcohol wasn't an option to go get drunk or that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, you know, for me, it was like work, work just seems to be good. So I'll just, I'll just work. Yeah. And so after my burnout, which I've talked about here before, mm -hmm. I, I kind of tried to really recalibrate and I also had no hobbies. So I would say, um, like, you know, this weekend I'm going to assemble a new barbecue. Well, that'll be fun. At least I got something to do. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but if work is your life, you kind of have no life, right? Yeah. yeah. I'd love to hear about a highlight over the last uh, 25 years. We yeah. talked about regret, but uh, we don't yeah. want to live there. One, we from, wanna... we get one from each. I yeah. love yeah. I'd love, I'd love that, yeah. Mm -hmm. A highlight. Oh, man, there's, there have been so many of yeah. them, yeah. so many. Yeah. Um, I would say every baptism hmm. is a highlight, yeah. every single one without exception. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Great, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my mind goes back to our launch of Conexus. Uh, so a lot more of you were there for that than <laughs> remember 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, but just seeing the heart of people come together to make, like it was, if you were going to do like how to launch a church, you can just take the way we did it and like it never should have worked. Right. Mm. Like there was right. so much that was, <laughs> right. that was riding on like, whoa, that was, do you know what how were some of those things? What were those things? Oh, great? well, we didn't have any money. We, we, we compressed the time limit, but we had a lot of mission and a lot of heart and people really came together. Mm. And uh, I mean, the people with 3 a.m. alarm clocks that would go right until COVID, right? Yes. Like this happened, mm -hmm. yes. you know, right until recently, and it will happen again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, your alarm clock rings at 3 a.m., so you can haul the trailers to bring things into a facility and, like, sacrifice. People have sacrificed so much, and I am... I am just so grateful, and I think that's the best of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, now we have a broadcast facility, mm -hmm. and we don't have to set up and tear down everything all the time. Mm -hmm. But I think is that entrepreneurial spirit, that, that desire, that, that commitment to the mission yeah. is what makes us who we are, and I hope we never lose that. Mm -hmm. Like, that is just exciting. It's inspiring. Yeah. You can do that until, well, for the rest of your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. So that's great. I, I mean, yeah. Carrie, what about sort of... Um, I want to talk, I kind of got two questions. Mm. One is kind of, what is the future of the church, wider church in North yeah. America? So I'm going to ask you that in a moment. But also, I would love to hear, you know, when you look at the church, future of the church, so you go, okay, as you've you planted it, you've seen it over 25 years, you look to the future. Um, one of the questions is, I think some people in these days feel like under the current political climate, under the current... Um, climate of cancel culture, um, as, as someone who wants to be a part of a church that's reaching people, wants to continue to live out my faith, I struggle with figuring out, you know, how do I do that? How do I engage unchurched people around me? How do I engage church people around me? Because as Tony was saying, people are coming from all kinds of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what you have to say about, you know, how do you talk to people? How do you listen to people? How do you engage with the people around you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is our moment right? Like this is a chance for the church to be the church because I think we're seeing tribalization and polarization. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, we have a unifying vision, like Jesus love extends to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have a, a tremendous opportunity as a church. 
And I think that starts with, you know, loving the people you live with, loving your neighbors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a chance for all of us to get to know our neighbors better, right. kind of socially distanced and appropriate. <laughs> right. And right. Deal. Right. Right. But, you know, we spend more time with our neighbors and in our neighborhood. And as much as you, so think about this. A lot of us have more time than we've ever had to connect with people because we're not jumping on airplanes. Yes. We're, not, we're not away. Work yeah. is weird, you know, the yeah. whole deal. Mm-hmm. And yet we can't get together with the people that we love. So I think this is the opportunity in the future where, okay, what if, what if you kept your current pacing or something like it, Mm -hmm. but you also use that bandwidth to reach your friends and neighbors. And Mm -hmm. so I think the future of the church, we've talked many times, you know, we have, you know, multiple locations and everything, but I think the future is micro gatherings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely going to have our locations. We're going to fill big rooms, et cetera, et cetera. That day is coming back. Mm -hmm. But we have an opportunity now, like what if we convene some backyard parties? Hmm. What if we convene some, like the small group model, but we do that to engage church. There mm-hmm. are people who come half an hour, 40 minutes. You know, your friends are not going to drive to a location for 40 minutes, but they might come to your house. Mm-hmm. And so I think we have a lot of opportunity. Like, I think basically the mold just got broken. Right. Mm-hmm. And when it's safe to gather again, we're definitely going to gather in big spaces. We're sure. definitely going to bring the band back and you know, the whole mm-hmm. deal. Everyone's going to be together. Right. We can sit close to each other. <laughs> yeah. Right. There's going to be no <laughs> masks. Like, right. there, that day is It will coming. come. We promise. It is coming. It will come. <laughs> it is coming. Yeah. But what if that wasn't the only thing that we did? What if we got inventive and creative? Like, I don't know what the number is, but I think we got close to 1,000 people in small groups now. Well, what if those became not just a place for the church to gather, but a church to expand mm-hmm. and, and all of that? So, you know, a church with three locations could become a church with 30 locations mm-hmm. or 50 locations or 100 locations. So I'm really looking forward to, to that mm-hmm. as, as we think about the future. And I I think, yeah, the world is never... See, what happened is we have lived, even in the 25 years that I've I've been in ministry, Mm -hmm. we have seen the further collapse of Christian culture in our midst. Mm -hmm. Canada is decidedly a post-Christian culture, which on some, you know, if you're stuck in an old model, you're like, oh, well, I miss those days when people used to pray. And, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, go go live in the past if you want. Mm -hmm. But that's how the church was forged. It was not a Christian culture. And it's a culture that realizes our answers are bankrupt. Our answers are empty. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe the gospel has the best answers that we have available to us. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. you know, we have an opportunity here and the, probably the hunger is deeper. And now if we can sort of spread out the forms a little bit more in how we are the church, how we become the church, I think the future could be explosive for the growth mm-hmm. of the ministry. Mm-hmm. And, and really, the, the purpose is not for church to grow. The purpose is for everybody yeah. to experience the saving love of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, um, one of the things that, that's been fun about this, I think is um, it's sort of we're celebrating, but you're not going anywhere, which is great. Celebrating, yeah. but you're not going anywhere. And, uh, but we want to mark a moment, and we're going to celebrate in person. So at yeah. some point, we will be in person, mm-hmm. and we will be celebrating. That day is coming. But we, we want to take a moment and give you a bit of a, a, a thank you as well today. And so um, we wanted to give you a chance to kind of look back a little bit over 25 Uh-oh. years. So we put a little bit uh. of a video together for you guys today. I, I okay. know I surprised you with this. Yeah. So um, we're going to put it on the screen. Okay.
to the launch of Connexus Berry and Aurelia. And it's just so cool to be part of a church um, that is going to impact communities and regions. At least that's our prayer. My personal vision is for people who don't go to church. My heart beats for families who are trying to figure out what's most important in life and who don't know where to turn. And often they think about church, but they don't think that we can help. Uh, We want to show them that, no, this is a place where anybody can come in and enter into a growing relationship with Jesus. This can be a place where you and your family, it doesn't matter what you did Saturday night, it doesn't matter how badly you feel your life is going or how well it's going, and, and you think you're responsible for that wellness. We want to create the kind of place where everybody can come, and uh, particularly where young families can come, and they can experience the hope and the light of Christ. That's my vision. That's what gets me up in the morning, day after day. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I'm not talking about abundance in terms of financial wealth or material possessions, but rather in terms of life as an adventure, uh, becoming more fully alive and participating in something that is bigger than myself. finally arrived. We've secured a 24-7 facility to act as a central hub for everything Connexus. In fact, I'm standing in it right now. to a brand new era at Connexus Church. We are so, so glad. This is the very first uh, message series we're filming in our brand new facility. And for those of you joining us at our Aurelia location, for those of you watching online, for those of you watching in Overflow, we are so glad uh, that you're here today. And we just hope this is gonna be an amazing experience.
Well, guys, uh, a bit of a <laughs> retrospective. <laughs> a bit of a yeah, retrospective. Yeah, a little emotional. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, just so grateful for both of you, for your heart, for your faithfulness, for your vision, um, and to just, um, you know, see that, that little video when the, it's just 25 years. How do you encapsulate it in a video? But a few little glimpses along the way. Would love to just hear, you know, as you look at it, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Um, Carrie, I'll throw it to you first. Yeah, I think of, you know, the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of the people. What you see in 25 years like that is just, you know, yeah, just so grateful for yeah. the people. Yeah. Sad that in this moment we can't be together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm just really grateful. A lot of you have sacrificed mm -hmm. yeah. deeply. Yeah. And it's been worth it. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. That's Over to Tony. I'm, yeah. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. <laughs> oh. You know it takes a lot to do this, too, yeah. right? I know, I know. Like. <laughs> You're getting me started, uh, too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm. I am so grateful for the journey mm. Jesus has brought us on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, um, we've seen the hand of God and the Holy Spirit move mm over and over and over again and mm -hmm. um and we still do mm -hmm. and it's uh it's exciting to see the path he brought us along and um exciting to face the future as well mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah. thanks for that video oh. yeah. wow yeah. and justin piercy put a lot of work into it so yeah. no no kidding so yeah. 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 that's, yeah. that's awesome and the team I, that's right and yeah, yeah you just you, you look back and it's really the people right. it's really the people and the faithfulness of god over and over again because yeah. what is the church if it's if it's not for people who are serving who are inviting their friends who yes. are giving who are who are just part of it. They're the heart and the soul. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that, that this actually worked as a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the fact that, that um, yeah, it's just, it's incredible. Yeah, you see, it's a reminder that so many, many people listened to God and yeah. said yes. Yes. Right, yeah. yes. right. Mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a church that's passionate about reaching unchurched people, Tony, I would love for you, if somebody's watching today and they'd say, Hey, I'm kind of on the fence about faith. I got questions about God. Um, we want to be the kind of church that welcomes them with open arms. What would you say to them if they're saying, "Hey, maybe this is maybe they're going to give up on the search, give up on the journey"? What would you What would you say? Oh, I would just applaud anyone who's on that search. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, uh, you're on an exciting journey. I would say keep going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you hear a lot about um, Christianity being a myth or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe Christianity is a, a collection of stories that help with social order and, mm -hmm. you know, help people cooperate. Um, Yuval Harari would say that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would say after decades of following Christ, uh, everything I read and the scriptures included, mm. um, keep pointing me back to the, the conclusion that Jesus is real. Mm. And not just what I read, but what I experience. Mm. Um, if you're on that journey, I would say that the critical question that you need to ask yourself is, did Jesus physically, like not metaphorically, not symbolically, but did Jesus physically rise from the dead? Mm. That's the question you need to chase down. Mm -hmm. Because um, if he did, and I believe he did, uh, that changes everything. Mm -hmm. It changes the course of human history. It changes how I view myself, mm -hmm. uh, my identity. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's an exciting journey. I would say carry on and chase down that question. And include God's word as you do, because there are eyewitnesses of that event who've recorded uh, what they learned in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And so read the Gospel of John, for example. Mm -hmm. Start there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. When people ask me, like, what is it uh, about, like, working with Carrie, knowing Carrie and Tony, what is one of the things that, like, you've really picked up that people don't talk about a lot? Mm -hmm. And the thing I always say is uh, ability to change, that they, that you mm -hmm. both have an ability. I, I think as many people get older, they get more entrenched. They change less. Mm -hmm. They get more entrenched in who they are. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you over the years have always had an ability to change and learn and be mm. curious. Mm. I'd just love to hear a little bit from you as to how you do that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, 
following Christ is a journey, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Even if you look at the word follow, Mm -hmm. it means like to go, to proceed, to come after. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. And so it, even just being a Christ follower has that, that connotation of movement. Huh. Mm-hmm. Um, even in the Old Testament, you know, we've, we read about the story of Moses leading the Israelites out of slavery and into freedom. Right. You know, and it's, we believe it's a story that actually happened, yeah. but, but it also works symbolically uh, in the, the journey that Christ takes us through. Mm-hmm. You know, we make a decision to follow him, but being a Christian is both a decision and a journey. Right. Yeah. So if you're, journey, if you're journeying, you're going somewhere. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that uh, what I've discovered for myself is that, um, you know, we go through our early years and we um, experience some of the hurts in life and we end up with some... Um, self-limiting beliefs, Mm -hmm. you know, lies that may be deeply embedded that we're not aware that we're, you know, are are governing our decisions Mm -hmm. and so on. And, uh, And so I do believe that following Christ is a process of gaining a little bit more and a little bit more freedom. Mm-hmm. Like Christ wants us to have freedom. God wants us to have freedom right. and to live live lives that are actually marked by love and peace and joy. Um, but sometimes that other junk gets in the way. Right. Right. And so, you know, I think one of the critical questions as we go through life and have opportunities or maybe a calling mm-hmm. that God has placed on your heart. And the question is, how are you going to make that decision? Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's um, Christ allows us to be brutally honest with ourselves Mm -hmm. and ask, is this a decision I'm making out of faith or is it a a decision founded on fear or maybe on pride, Mm -hmm. you know, or is there some mixture? And Mm -hmm. so, um, so I do think that, you know, that process of change happens as we become more and more open to what Jesus wants for us and where he wants to take us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear from either of you when it comes to kind of identifying. um, So, so you talked about sort of there's the original baggage of what you kind of are picking up along the way. Mm -hmm. So, if 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 someone is like, man, I realize I've got a lot of baggage. Mm -hmm. uh, Step one, I think absolutely they're going to want to open up to Jesus and figure Mm -hmm. that out. And then, what are some of the other things that you've done in order to help? identify what those things are in your life, in your marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, hate it to, to ask the, you, you ask the question, then you get the answer. <laughs> then you don't like the answer. It's like, what is this? Yeah. What, what have the, what have the two of you done? Hmm. You start. Well, I think we've, we've learned to look inside. I think we went through mm-hmm. a period in our relationship and we'll talk about that in a future series, one mm-hmm. that you're kind of anchoring yeah. where, um, I think, you know, I thought you were the problem. You thought I was the problem. Mm-hmm. I thought everybody else was the problem. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've learned through a journey of counseling is, um, no, I'm the problem. <laughs> I am, I am the common denominator <laughs> in my life. Mm-hmm. I am the problem in our marriage. So that really, really helped. And it allows you you know, that journey, which is a journey of prayer, a journey of, you know, a good Christian counselor in our case has been really good. And then just a lot of introspection, confession, you kind of realize, oh, this is what I bring, you know, that's not good to the relationship. And that actually brings the promised new life you talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's the process of being saved, like that moment where you come to faith in Jesus or that season Mm -hmm. where you turn your life over to Jesus. But then the Christian journey is a journey of being made new, which ties Mm -hmm. into your first Mm -hmm. question, which is like, yeah, I'm going to be being made new till if I live that long, 80, 90, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like that is, that is a daily journey and it gives you something exciting to wake up to every day. You're learning, you're curious, you know that God isn't finished. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and, and we are actually, we've, we've done it long enough now that I think we see tangible results, mm-hmm. like in our relationship, in our relationship with each other, with others, yes. with our kids, with our family, where we're growing and maturing. Mm-hmm. And, and as we talked about in part one of the interview, mm-hmm. you know, maturity is defined by love. So right. some of those mm-hmm. things, when you move them out of the way, when you confess them, when you, when, you know, Jesus deals with them, you're more loving, you're more open. Right. And I hope that that's a journey that continues. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I would say uh, the journey looks different for different people. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for me, it was a combination of what Carrie's talked about, um, reading scripture. You know, yeah. sometimes 
uh, the Holy Spirit just brings the scripture alive with something that I need to see mm-hmm. um, through uh, close friendships, mm-hmm. friendships with other Christians who can help expose my blind spots. Mm-hmm. Um, Christian counseling definitely helped. Mm-hmm. Uh, even reading books. I mean, I, I voraciously consumed books that related to personal growth and my Christian journey yes. um, all the way along. Yeah. So, yeah. And all that. Yeah. Small, yeah. And, and also yeah. also yeah. small group. Oh, yeah. small, small group, group has really been instrumental in our in our growth yeah. our growth mm-hmm. and uh, and helping us um, just get through the tough seasons yeah. that we were having personally. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah, Carrie, something I've learned from you, a phrase you've said before, is the idea that it's your character, not your competency, that that really develops high-capacity leaders and people. I'd love to hear just how you've developed your character over the years and what we could learn from that. Yeah, it's a work in progress, yes. so, you know, I'm not done yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah no, I've, I've thought about that a lot. You know, and the older you get, the longer you're in leadership, and the more you think, what are the real caps? So you talk to a 25-year-old Carrie, it's like competency, go right. to the right school, yeah. read the right books, you know, get the right mentor, and you grow your skill set. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, over the years, I've just seen, you know, top leader in business and politics and in ministry, sadly, get felled, not because they weren't smart, not yeah. because they weren't, they didn't have skill. Not, some of them are the, the most gifted preachers, leaders you can imagine, but it was their character. Mm-hmm. And then I've also done enough funerals over the years to realize <laughs> that no, I've never done a funeral where grown kids show up at the casket and say, you know, have you seen my dad's last quarter? Like, weren't his numbers impressive? Mm, yes. and, or the size of the bank account or whatever. And it's like, that stuff doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Now, I want things to grow and I, I want to get better at my yeah. skill set. Mm-hmm. But what you are going to remember, what my family is going to remember, what my closest friends are going to remember, and I think what's close to God's heart is actually character. Mm-hmm. So, you know, competency gets you in the room. Character keeps you in the room. And ultimately, I've, I've come to believe that your character is the lid on your capacity. Mm. So mm-hmm. what took years to build, you can ruin in a moment. Yes. And I, I just, I'm like, that's a lot of confession. That's a lot of um, staying close to people. That's a lot of, um, you know, of work and continual personal growth. So mm-hmm. I've kind of left it at this. And I wrote about it a couple of years ago in a book, and I would even amend it from what I said in the book. But mm-hmm. I want the people closest to me to have the best experience of me. Mm-hmm. And I found that the bigger the church has gotten, like I wish I knew everybody who went to Connexus. I don't know who goes yeah, to Connexus. Right. There's lots of people, yeah. right? And, and then with some of the other ministry I do, there's a lot of people. But I don't, what does it matter if somebody who I've never met in person thinks I'm great and my wife can't stand me? Mm-hmm. Like I would rather, and we weren't there always, but mm-hmm. that I'm hoping that we get the best of each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that the people who actually know you and are closest to you get the best experience of you. Yeah. Interesting. Care, I I care, I've, I've, never, I've never heard you talk about this. What do you think is the difference between discipline and character? Oh, like, are they different? Yeah. Do they work together? Oh, they're related. Um, yeah. Like, how does, like, what do you think? So character development for me has really come out of a number of disciplines. It's a great question, Jeff. One would be my morning quiet time. So when the kids were younger, like when we started here, we had a three-year-old and a newborn. And, you know, so that was 25 years ago. So anyway, uh, you know, sometimes quiet times were really short. They were five minutes, eight minutes or whatever I could squeeze in. Now it's more like an hour in the morning because we're just at the empty nest phase of life. Our kids are independent and we, we just have more time. And it's that reflection, it's journaling, it's trying to figure out what your friends or counselor or spouse is saying and going, oh... That's on me. So I would say discipline has been core to that. And then also the discipline of learning. Um, I'm also always trying to read, always listening to audio books, uh, reading you know, physical books, and then listening to podcasts, trying to grow and get better. And so it's that discipline of personal growth, spiritual growth, mm-hmm. that I think has an impact on, on um, character. Mm-hmm. Justin and Sarah, who are hosting today, they gave me a gift a few years ago. And it's just a quote I often say from, I think it's Socrates, it's that the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm-hmm. And it hangs in our house. And it's just a reminder, oh, no, you need to examine this and see, see how you can grow, because I'm not done yet. Mm-hmm. So I, I think the two are very interrelated. And if you look at some of the most, uh, the people with the best character are often very disciplined people. Right, right, yeah. right. It's, it's an interesting connection. Yeah, like I even think of some of the disciplines that I've learned from you, uh, disciplines that, that you would have like, 
um, when it's a difficult conversation, sometimes you just need to pick up the phone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned that from Andy Stanley. Yeah, Thank you, Andy. And that, and that's, and that really, at the end of the is mm-hmm. a discipline. Or um, if, if you said you're going to do it, you need to do everything you can to make sure you actually do it. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those, those are small decisions that, like, discipline decisions that create character in some ways. And I, I learned a lot of that from my parents, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, my mom and dad are probably watching, and they're, they're incredible. They've been a big part of this story as well. Mm-hmm. But I would, I would see them, like, I gave my word, and I watched my dad, like, lose money on contracts because right. he said he would do, they ran a business for years, right. mm-hmm. he said he would do it at this price, and he had to eat it because, right. you know, costs right. went out of control or yeah. right. steel was more expensive or something. So those, are, those I had an unfair head start. Right, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. yeah. A, a, a number of people, because we, we did ask some, que- some questions, a number of people asked, we invited questions. Mm. A number of people had marriage questions. And um, sorry if I didn't include one of your questions today. We can include all the questions. <laughs> but um, there was a question about stages of your marriage and, and thoughts around the different stages. So when you had little kids and then um, as your kids grew up and then as you, you've been the two of you as empty nesters at this point, mm-hmm. would love to hear maybe uh, starting with you, Tony, would love to hear your thoughts on things that you've learned in your marriage through those stages or things that you've done that have been helpful through the different stages? Yeah, at the early stage, we didn't have a lot of time together before we had Jordan. So um, oh, yeah. in, the, in the very early stage, I would say um, we did spend a lot of time together and that was a good solid we were foundation busy, we for were us. We were in law school, so mm-hmm. we met yeah. and 18 months later we were married and 18 months later we, we had parents. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. So I, was, I was actually like, pregnant in my last semester yeah, of law yeah, school. I was articling in Toronto. <laughs> so we were busy, mm-hmm. like really, really law schools. <laughs> yeah, busy, yeah. but we've we had a lot of time together. We did have um, deep conversations. We mm-hmm. did go through uh, a marriage um, prep course mm-hmm. that Which took I us do not through. Remember. Yeah, I remember. I don't. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <how> it <laughs> it's um, a good idea to to go to actually sign up for and do a course because typically they'll bring questions that you wouldn't think of on your own. Yeah. So that's a that's a great prep. Um, in the early years, um, when when our kids were young, I think. Um, we we struggled at that stage oh, yeah. because I think we were just overcommitted, mm-hmm. and we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, that's where I felt that you know I can st- see with twenty twenty hindsight how helpful it would have been to have a mentor mm-hmm. at that stage. Um, but in those years, my advice for people who have young kids is is just to really try to stay on the same page in planning out your family time very mm-hmm. deliberately mm-hmm. so that um, you carve away time for the two of you for your marriage um, because it's just so easy to juggle all the moving pieces, um, but the marriage time... Yeah. gets pushed to the wayside yep. uh, and um, and if when we were at that stage the problems that we were having and the tough emotions that we were experiencing was um, was a disincentive at that point I think for us to to really carve that time oh, yeah. so get under that like <laughs> right. where you know right. where you feel like it's not good you don't <clears throat> want to make time to hang out when date, you don't want to hang out exactly yeah yeah. Yeah. No yeah at that stage we uh, we had a hard time having the the incentive and the motivation to carve the time and if that's where you're at then find out what's underneath it mm-hmm. like that's a time where it's not a crisis but you've got this dynamic going on go to a counselor, you know, get some help to figure out what's going on under, underneath that because there's probably um, ways that you can become closer and yeah. overcome those barriers yeah. and better to get it early as opposed to later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say, yeah, pre-kids, we were pretty busy just finishing up law school and everything. Then we had kids and then we came up here to start ministry. I would say if there was a temptation in those the stages where the kids were young, if things weren't going well, I would throw myself uh, into my work, mm. into the ministry. And is it mm. fair to say you would throw your, yourself into the kids? Oh, absolutely okay. fair. So yeah. the kids were sort yeah. of your escape yes. and work mm. was my escape, mm. which mm-hmm. is not because all you're left with, like at this stage, you know, we were in our 40s when we became empty nesters a few years ago. And 
you know, you have a lot of time with each other. Hopefully you like each other by that point. <laughs> right. Right. And I remember there was a time when our oldest, Jordan, when he got his driver's license and he got his G2 or whatever it is, where you could actually drive without an adult in the car. And so mm -hmm. he took his brother, this dates it, in a blockbuster, okay, oh, okay. Yeah. to oh, rent yeah. a video. <laughs> I remember those. To rent a video. <laughs> and he drove into town. And I remember watching him, you know, you're nervous because he's driving on his own for the first time. Driving out, and we're watching through a picture window in our... In our um, living room, and I just looked at Tony, and I had this moment where I just realized, wow, we're still young, we have a lot of time ahead of us, mm -hmm. and what's left of our relationship? Like, we weren't, mm -hmm. we weren't on the road to divorce, but it was like, wow, we're going to have a lot of time, and so we talked about it, prayed about it, mm -hmm. uh, developed some shared things we love to do, like I started mm -hmm. cycling, you bought a bike, you love to snowshoe, I got snowshoes, and just yeah. forging out this friendship that had yes. first brought us together, it's like, well, now we have time for that again, and mm -hmm. I would say we're better friends than we'd ever been when we first started dating. Mm -hmm. But you have that's something you have to, again, to discipline, right? Rhythm. So date mm -hmm. night became a regular thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was probably more counseling at that season as well than, than we seem to, you know, require at this point. But no, you, you know, you build a real friendship mm -hmm. and um, that's yeah. what's getting us through. And a curiosity and a sense of what's new and ahead and next. And so these days, most days are pretty fun. <laughs> They are, yeah, yeah, and shared experiences mm -hmm. lead to intimacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to um, to keep growing, you know, and, and share experiences together that grow both of you, yeah. like try something new. You know, we make it a, a point while we're traveling or when we have some time off to add something that it has a little bit of variety mm -hmm. right. in it. It does seem to uh, bring us closer. And, mm -hmm. you know, when, you, when you're dealing with the unexpected, mm -hmm. um, when you deal with it together, whether, <laughs> whether it's a challenge right. or whether it's just <laughs> something new and delightful, you know, it's a shared experience that leads to a closer bond. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Yeah, I love how you, how you think long-term on the, like, life for you feels like chapters to me, not mm -hmm. finish lines. Like, oh, I, yeah. I think when people... No, finish lines have it. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people, a lot of us feel like, oh, well, like, when the kids move out, let's say, like, that's the finish line. Like, yeah. we forget that, no, like, that's just the end of it. Because I think people get there and go, like, oh, now what do we do with our marriage? Like, now it's yeah. just yeah, the two of us. Right. We got to, this isn't a finish line. Now I'm realizing I've got a whole bunch of my life ahead of me, mm -hmm. and I didn't really think about it. So I love how you're, you think about the long-term hey, what will the next stage be like versus I'll figure it out when I get to the next stage, which yeah. is different. Yeah, yeah, and I'm so, I'm so grateful for how you're both so willing to, to share parts of your life with, whether it's through the podcast mm -hmm. or through your writings or preaching, you know, you're just willing to share, but, you know, doing so appropriately, how do you decide? Like, how do you determine what's helpful for people to share uh, parts of your life versus overshare yeah yeah <laughs> lots of people overshare yeah. right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well and which is um i mean sharing these days is so easy i yes, mean we've got right. so many yes. platforms our yeah. whole lives can be exposed i i think it's a matter of going through and processing mm -hmm. anything that's painful before mm -hmm. you're actually sharing it publicly. Oh, yeah. So I, I think it's actually an inverse relationship when you think about it, that while the, while the pain of whatever it is you're trying to talk about, the problem is high, mm -hmm. then the um, sharing with other people should be low. Right. With the so public. It, yeah, yeah, with, with the, the public. public. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, share with one or two yes. people who are close who, you know, yes. will help you and give you wise advice mm -hmm. or with a counselor or whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. anyway, while the pain is intense, public sharing is low. But then once you've processed it and you've moved it along so yes. that, you know, the intensity of that pain is now low, but you've gained perspective mm -hmm. and hopefully you've gained Jesus' redemptive purpose in, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that pain involved, mm -hmm. then your public sharing can be high Good. because hopefully um, you will jumpstart other people's right. progress yeah, through yes. what you've learned. Yeah. 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 Man, that's really that's good. So good. When the pain is... When the pain is high, sharing low publicly yeah. and yeah. then vice versa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and really you do need helpful. to process it, right? Like we yeah. were very fortunate, whether that was our small group counselors, good friends, family, we were able to process our pain 
And mm. I've learned there's a point where, where it's just helpful. If I can yes. help you, yes. then probably, not that I have all the answers or whatever, but if, if this is actually going to serve some redemptive purpose, mm -hmm. then maybe mm. talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I love your like inverted pyramid thing. That's brilliant. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. 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 Carrie, I would love for you, I, I don't want to miss this question. I think it's an important one for today. What's your heart for our church moving forward? Oh, mm. Just to keep reaching more people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have seen there was a real challenge when we got here in that the majority of people didn't go to church. But mm -hmm. culture has changed that much in two and a half decades where the need is higher than ever mm -hmm. and the indifference is greater than ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a point at which, you know, there was a time where people thought, oh, it's Sunday, should I go to church? And now it's like, mm -hmm. they don't even think about yes. that, right? Yeah. It's not even, not even a category. Well, how, what do you think happened there? Why the indifference? What's the, what's oh, the we of... become post-Christian. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at what happened to Europe in the last century or two, uh, that's definitely coming. It's happening right now in the United States, mm -hmm. which America is very rapidly becoming post-Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think people, a lot of people just don't even know anymore. It's not that, like, I think we went through a phase where people knew about Christianity yeah. and they rejected, rejected. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we're at a phase where they're like, Jesus, I don't even know. Like, mm -hmm. what? I heard about him once. Like, mm -hmm. there's a song about mm -hmm. him or something. Yeah. But they really don't know and so, you know, my heart is, I'm concerned that there are people who woke up this morning who, who don't even know that there's hope. Mm -hmm. Like, at least give them a chance to hear the story. At least give them a chance to see authentic Christianity, not the bad headlines, not mm -hmm. the schmaltzy mm -hmm. church, not the, the worst of, of what the church sometimes is, mm -hmm. but, but show them the authentic Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, haven't, I was thinking about this this morning. I haven't done the math in a while. But last time I checked, I think there's over 300,000 people who don't go to church within a 30-minute drive of our locations. Yeah, yeah that's like, probably true. Okay, so I, I see that as a lot of opportunity. Yes. I don't know. So right. I think the future is indefinite, and it's going to take all of us, mm -hmm. and it's going to take all of us doing something where we live, in our homes, mm -hmm. where we are, to reach our friends and neighbors who don't know the love of Jesus. So mm -hmm. that's what I think about for the church. And mm -hmm. the forms will take care of themselves. Yeah, we're going to gather for public worship. Yeah, you know, but hey, we can imagine ways of being the church that have not been imagined before mm -hmm. because we haven't lived through the post-Christian, post-modern 21st century before. So right. the church at its best, you know, we're part of the reform movement, but the church reformed and always reforming. Mm -hmm. We're in an always reforming moment. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like the Reformation happened centuries ago and now it's, you know, codified. No, mm -hmm. um, you know, scripture is, is, is eternal. Well, not eternal. It's until we see Jesus right. as our guide, mm -hmm. right. right? Face to face. Heaven's eternal. Jesus is eternal. Um, but the methods have to change to preserve the mission. So I think mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to reinvent methods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and we've never been reminded more in my lifetime that it's people who reach people, oh, not, yeah. not mm -hmm. buildings that reach people. Yeah, yeah buildings you know. are actually a limiter. Yeah. If you really want to think about the future, buildings limit us because they say, you know, at a certain time, at a certain place, you have to be here. And I'm a big fan of buildings. I'm sure. glad we built what They're we great built. Tools. We've done yes. what we've done. Mm -hmm. They're tools, but yes. that's it. It mm -hmm. is not. And a lot, of, a lot of church leaders, and I know you don't fall into this camp, mm -hmm. treat it as though the only way ministry can happen is in a building at set hours on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And if that's our, our model, it's so limiting and restricting. Mm -hmm. Now we got lots of people who are watching from home. Yeah. So we have hundreds of buildings, thousands of buildings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's use those mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as well as the buildings that we have at our disposal. Right, right. Mm -hmm. a, friend, a friend of mine said to me recently, um, if, if you have to have a building to be a church, say that to all the persecuted Christians yeah. around the world. Well, there was no yeah. building for 300 yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, the first yeah. for my research, Duras Europa, AD 256, was the first church building where they kind of outgrew house churches and mm -hmm. away we go. So do I think mm -hmm. buildings are great? I think buildings are great, yeah. but I think, I think they can be a limit on what God can do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's go beyond it. Um, Carrie, as, as we kind of wrap up today, there are a couple things that I'd like to do. One is I would love to give you, um, you've, you've cast vision for so many years. The person who's watching today who says, you know, I'm not sure about creating a church that unchurched people love. Like, I'm a Christian. I would call myself a follower of Jesus, but it means giving up my preferences, or mm -hmm. it, sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, what about sort of a, a church that maybe 
would be more comfortable for me or more traditional for you, for me. What are your what, what are your thoughts? I'd love for you to kind of speak to that person a bit. Yeah, well, that's kind of where we started 25 years ago. Those three little churches, which were super small, six, 14, and then 23, where the average attendance is, <laughs> like that is where Church for Church people leads mm. in this mm. culture. And so I, I watched it, and they were kind of on. And and anyone who was there, there's just a handful of us left, would tell you this. Mm-hmm that they knew that it was, they were on life support. Mm -hmm. And so they hired the student out of Toronto to come up here (laughs) and lead them. And I thought I'd be here for 18 months and a quarter century later, here we are Mm -hmm. uh, doing it with these people. But we quickly went from an inward focused vision to an outward focused vision. Mm -hmm. And that not just brought life to new people, it brought life to them. Mm -hmm. And I think when I think about all the people that have joined us on this journey over 25 years, they, they have found new life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mm -hmm. because, and I'm not criticizing other churches uh, or that kind of thing. We have some great churches in the area. Mm -hmm. But when it's an inward focus and you're focused on the needs of the members, it's like, imagine living your life that way where you just said, okay, Jeff, you and I are gonna be about each other and the kids and that's all we're gonna do. We're not gonna open our life to anyone else. Like eventually, that becomes so insular and so narrow and so confining. Mm -hmm. You're not even gonna be friends anymore, right? Mm -hmm. right? Your life gets better because it moves outward. Mm -hmm. And and that's not because, you know, oh, we should do church that way because it's better. No, the reason your life works better that way is because that's how God designed us to behave. And when we behave that way and we start to reach out into the culture and we invite our friends and this is not about me. Like part of the real joy of this for me is Mm -hmm. um, if this was ever about me, and there are moments where sometimes it is, you know, we all have mixed motives. It's like, well, now it fully can't be. So, you know, I'm not even, I don't even work here anymore. So, you know, how how does that work? But we get to partner with a church that is outward focused. And we have neighbors and friends and family members that we hope will meet Jesus. So to me, that's what every church should be. Uh, I think that's one of the unique ingredients of, of what makes our church what it is. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I would just say, you know, otherwise you just end up kind of looking inward and <laughs> it's very, un- the more selfish I become, think about this from a human standpoint, right? Who is your selfishness attractive to? Right. It's only attractive to right. you. Yeah, I'm right. very attracted by my selfishness. Yeah. You are not attracted by my selfishness. <laughs> you guys are not attracted by my selfishness. I think it's wonderful. And when a church becomes selfish and inward focused, I just think we, and then, and then you, okay, your job now is to please everybody. Right. Mm-hmm. Good luck with that, Jeff. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Come visit mm-hmm. you in the hospital. Right. You know, like right. that is not gonna go well. So yeah. when you have an outward focus, a unified mission, and you're reaching cities, yeah. and you're reaching an area, or now, you know, thanks to technology, well beyond. We right. have yeah. watching mm-hmm. communities, viewing communities from around the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, man, I could give the rest of my life to that. Right. Yeah. right. Really, really appreciate yeah. both of you. And what I want to do is just take a minute and pray for you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. God, we thank you for Carrie and Tony. And uh, in a sense, the mentors they are to us as a community as a whole. And uh, we thank you for their heart to see people reached. Um, their heart to a sacrifice in order that the gospel might move forward and that people would know Jesus. And if there's any baton that I pray we're faithful in taking, it's that one, Mm -hmm. that we would be faithful in pointing people to you each and every day. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for the gift of their leadership, their friendship to Leslie and I and to our community. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.